Greetings and salutations, everyone. Welcome back to the Inn of Planar Crossroads, and as always, welcome back to our Around the Hearth discussions. This time is the modern Megiddo, or kind of the modern apocalypse, the kind of uh, less fantastical, less magical, more real-life type of apocalypse. Real life with quotes. Type of apocalypse. So, that's what we're going to be going over this time. Before we get into that, let's do some quick announcements with our introductions, and then we will do Levi's Spotlight. So, this time, let's do... I'll go first like I usually do, and then we'll go Dennis, Avenue, and Squirrel. So. We got this. Yeah. I'm Adam L. Spain with the End of Planar Crossroads. We hope that you are enjoying our content, and if you would like to support it or track us down on the different social medias, you can do that by clicking over to theiopc.com or endofplanarcrossroads.com. Either one works. And that will lead you to our landing page. Basic landing page right now, but I'm working on it, okay? And it is going to be able to show you our social media links and also are links to support us in different ways. So, that's what we've got. Hoping to get to $100 per month support. Right now we're at about 20-ish. So, maybe we'll get there soon. Maybe we won't. It'll take a little time. But once we do, I'm planning to do some metal dice, Lord willing. So, mm, rare run metal dice. Should be an attractive prospect for, for you collectors out there. Get it when we were a small YouTube channel. All right. Um, that's what I have. So, okay, SDM. Hi, I'm Dennis. I run the OKSDM OK YouTube channel where I make mistakes playing games so you don't have to. Uh, lately, uh, most of the channel has been live playtests of sagas setting in genre agnostic system a TTRPG that I'm in the midst of developing. We're planning planning on doing a uh, January Kickstarter, so it's going to be in development for at least a couple more months. Uh, but you can pick it up for free right now on Drive Through RPG. Just go in, go over there and search Sagas S A G A S Playtest, and it should be what like the first or second thing. Look for OKest RPG Publishing. Um, it is free. That's the coolest part. It's free, and even in its final form, it's going to be pay what you want. I don't want to put any uh, any of this uh, basic SRD behind a paywall. I want this to be as accessible as possible. So if you like being able to learn a real simple rule system that can be used for any setting in any genre, we've, we've tried to... We've really pushed the limits of this thing. We've done... Pokemon, we've done zombie apocalypse, we've done high fantasy. We this morning, uh, a survivor RPG version of sagas was pitched, um, and I think it's actually going to happen, which is the wildest part. But everything has been uh, just fit absolutely fantastically. So if you want a copy of it, go over to Drive Through RPG and pick it up yourself for free. All right, I think that's us then. Dan from Avenue Studios. You can check us out on Rumble, YouTube, and anywhere you find your podcast during this theme month collaboration with the Interplanar Crossroads. Join us on the second and fourth Thursdays of every month where we build a one shot and play test it using the concepts we talk about here and around the hearth. And of course, our supporters enter a raffle to be a part of that live play at the end of the month. So join the ever growing forest and you can join us on those games. And of course, check us out Wednesdays, 6 30 p.m. Eastern for our live campaign after quest where currently we are in a nobles game in dungeons and dragons fifth edition so check us out there i'm great mustache jp i'm the uh creative director and owner of seven sphere which uh owns the open legend rpg and uh do stuff with that i'm zach underwood i'm just lucky <laughs> Yeah. Like every That's gnome. True. <laughs> like every gnome. <laughs> All right, Squirrel. Hey, um, I'm Scrant from Squirrel Plays over on YouTube. I chit chat about world building and character building and some ins and outs of making a story fun and enjoyable. But um, while I do lean towards TTRPGs, that is not all it's for. For example, I guess probably by the time this episode comes out, uh, 
video I'm currently working on is about how much world building is too much world building, where we do actually look at both TTRPGs and just generic general writing. So you get you get the best of both there. It's never enough. Oh, too <laughs> much world building. What is this concept? <laughs> Probably should all watch that video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. But yeah, that's that's about all I got right there. Love it. Okie dokie. Levi? Tag, Levi's it. Yep. yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Popcorn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and today I am shouting out Gelatinous Rube. A gelatinous cube gained sentience and became a cowboy. Now that gelatinous cube would like to talk to you about TTRPG campaigns. I've been watching a series talking about how to roll, run a more traditional old school style where you have way too many people playing way too often for me to handle in my current real life, but it sounds cool. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. <clears throat> so that one's set. That means, dear travelers and viewers, that we have finished our announcements, finished our Levi's Spotlight and now we ask you to grab your preferred beverage. Join us around the hearth while we discuss the modern Megiddo. Skol. Skol. Mm. All right. So, let's start out like we usually do. <laughs> Battlefield Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Only in this month has it been Only. that way. <laughs> Let's start out as we usually do, going over some media references as well as key points so that everybody can be on the same page. For the modern Megiddo, you can have... In our first chat, we listed off several things. There's pathological, alien, alien or impact events, technological, ecological, societal collapse, or entropic type of gradual degradation that can all apply to a modern Megiddo. This is where your sci-fi apocalypses and other things like that start to fall. And uh, things like Fallout, which we've been mentioning several, every chat, Mad Max is also a very good type of post-apocalypse that is very... There's some hope in it. Like in your individual lives, there's hope. But the whole world is basically a desert or something like that. So there's not a whole lot of hope. But there's some hope for you individually. So that is a possibility. Most zombie movies that you see today are going to fall under this moniker as the modern Megiddo. So, what you guys got for this particular one? This this type of apocalypse? I think one of the first things that needs to be talked about for this, especially uh, coming off the... Uh, having lived through COVID... Um, it needs to be discussed uh, as far as like safety tools for your game. Um, because sometimes when, if someone was severely affected by uh, COVID itself or some other apocalypse like event that they might have, might have lived through, um, make sure that it's okay to run an apocalypse like thing by them. Uh, especially if it is similar to something that actually happened. Um, safety, at least in my games, and I think should be across all games, should be like the number one most important thing. Um, people need to be safe and feel safe at a table in order for people to have fun, and that's the whole point of the game. Um, so I think having that conversation, again, I keep talking about conversations with your players, but it's important, so I'm yeah. going to keep talking about it, and you can't make me do anything different. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think you need to, um, if you're planning on a uh, virus outbreak of like a sickness spreading around the world apocalypse, clear that with your players first. Yep. Yeah. 
it makes sense that, like, the realer the apocalypse is in vibe, maybe the more you want to check in on that, because, like, there are more mm. points of relatability, like, you may not know that someone has a, like, specific anxiety relating to nuclear fallout. There's a lot of reasonable reasons that might be in people's minds, and, like, having them show up and, like, feeling like they can't be a part of your game sucks when you could have had a different apocalypse. <laughs> and I'm not absolutely not saying don't do those kinds of apocalypses, uh -huh. because you can get into some really, really intense and fun... Uh, if you think, if you're into that kind of thing, the roleplay can be really intense when the players can relate that much to what the characters are going through because they also went through it or something similar at one point. Mm -hmm. um, I personally watched the show Station Eleven um, as COVID was happening, and at times it was really, really too real because um, uh, Station Eleven is a... Uh, is a show and it starts off it is mostly post-apocalypse um but it starts off with a fever going around the world and everybody shutting down and you could see uh the main character just goes to a grocery store and stocks up ties carts together and brings food and toilet paper out of the store as much as they could um fear of being close to someone that coughed uh, and it was it was extremely relatable, and uh, it was very anxiety inducing to watch that. So, it, for me personally, yeah. um, just because I like that kind of controlled stress, yeah. um, but when it's something that is again, it's if it's something that's relatable. Um, and someone could have, in theory, actually lived through it or have serious anxiety about um, said apocalypse, conversation needs to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and it's true whether it's an apocalypse or just any kind of content as a rule. Yes. It's good to clear that. Mm -hmm. good one. Well, it's important to remember, too, that when you, got, when you say, hey, guys, we're going to run, I'm thinking to run a post-apocalypse game. You want to play? Usually, that's a, it, it doesn't have to be a super complicated thing. It's that, it can be that simple as, hey, guys, I'm going to play, we're going to play this. You got, what you guys think? And it can be something as simple to start that conversation. Because most of the time, when you're wrapping up mm -hmm. a campaign anyway, you're going to come to the point where it's like, all right, guys, well, we're getting pretty close. You guys are about to face a big boss. Think about what you want to do next for your game, for the game. Even if you don't live, type of thing, you know, rib them a little bit with that. It's, that can be that can be fun for them to figure out. All right, then they start spitballing, and then they'll bring up certain types of things you want to play, or you guys will have the conversation organically. So that's a way to go for it, because mm -hmm. playing a post-apocalyptic yeah. game, it's a lot easier. There's a lot less buy-in that you have to have because. Usually it's far enough away and removed that it doesn't mess with anything. Like most everybody right. can play Fallout the games because it's it's a it's a removed and far away type of apocalypse. Uh, it's hundreds of years in the past, so it doesn't affect everybody's personal life right then. This set, aside from the basic side effects that everybody's facing, uh, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, th this it definitely applies more to the, uh, like we discussed in the last one, the interim apocalypse, where the apocalypse is actually happening. Hmm. Because then every story becomes personal. <laughs> in the mm -hmm. intra apocalypse, every story is personal because everybody's having to live. So that's when you're when uh, you're in the post apocalypse, yeah, you absolutely. get to build up society. So. But it is, it is a definitely still a pitfall that needs to be considered. That's what the prompt on my screen is, so I wanted to mm -hmm. talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> we've had, we've yeah, you're good. Session zero, right? Oh, it was something yeah. to the equivalent. 
And we're playing a talking game. It's all based on talking. It's good to talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> Who talks to each other? Yeah, Who that's says, <laughs> says the Says the people that are all sitting around the digital table. To, yeah. Talks to each other. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so as someone that has run post-apocalyptic games in a semi-modern setting, i.e. I used Fallout Fort Smith, I did something that I recommend anybody who's doing a game in any kind of near- modern time setting do and that is use real maps yo you don't have to make up new maps yes take take maps absolutely maps of cities are great for like if you're going to play in new york in the 1920s 30s 40s 50s there's maps for that you don't have to make it up Mm -hmm. and you can say Mm -hmm. you can just replace whichever store you want to in the city and say it's right here because who in your group is going to be from 19... Who's going to be from and care about 1940s New York? You know, if you're running a, something in 1940s New York. They're not going to say, No, that was the grocery store. That wasn't the pawn shop or whatever. It's like, right. yeah, they, you know, you got mm-hmm. it. Um, Why not? I'm in... I'm playing in a streamed Fallout game right now uh, over on Cybernation Uncensor- Uncensored on Twitch. And we're using the <clears throat> Modifius's 2D20 system because uh, they have like there's a it's an actual Fallout RPG that they published. It's amazing, um, and that's what we're playing. And the GM for that or the overseer um, will pull up actual maps. Like we were trying to find a place to recharge our fusion cores, um, and, and we had to look at actual like Google. We pulled up Google Maps. And we tried to find uh, an, a hydroelectric dam close to us so that we could go there and hope that it was still working. And our players would actually have these physical maps. So it was like very, very uh, immersive in that sense because you can actually have the physical maps that your players would have. So 100%. Yes, maps, 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 if you can. Yeah. That falls. I was just thinking that it's it's like the flip side of what we started with. What you started with, Dennis, too, is on the positive end. Even if you're playing real time or slightly in the future, it can be very immersive if everyone's down for it. And in. Yeah. that's something where it's like, oh, you could even set it in your hometown if everyone's down for that. Like, what would this look like? That could be very cool to play with. Well, there's always that joke game that everybody wants to play, right? Where you make yourselves in the in the game. <laughs> And then you play right. yourself in that world, doing the things you do and stuff. I think so. that's like how most people start with TTRPGs. They just kind of make themselves because that's just the easiest one to play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But post apocalypse, or but the apocalypse comes to Maple Laugh. I mean, we play ourselves. <laughs> we have to survive. Let's do that. <laughs> We've never talked about that before. No, no. <laughs> We could LARP it, you know. <laughs> okay, Dan, Dan, you gotta, you gotta rein him in. Okay, your production value is only so high at the moment. All right. If you're gonna LARP it, you may as well film it, right? And then if you film it, well, you may as well release it, right? And if you're gonna release it, you may as well do it right, right? I see Dan, the the Dan yeah, high Dan standards. High standards. Yeah. You don't have to build any sets. You just have to destroy things. Just yeah, break people's houses, easy. break people's cars. Just, you just have to just. <laughs> Go public property. It's fine. That's all. Yeah. You know. <laughs> what was it? Um, I think it was Quentin Tarantino said, it'll be fine. I'll blow up this building. It's on film. It'll last forever. <laughs> yeah, don't you want to be immortalized? <laughs> yeah. I, I think one of my favorite things about doing something in the, um, the modern, real world, or slightly sci-fi setting is that the tech tree is something that people generally understand. So mm. if you... If you destroy society and you're trying to build back up well you know people kind of know what you need to advance to get like food and water up and running to start regrowing things how to like start rebuilding a car or rebuilding um a tractor something you know some useful tools um you know where to hunt and look for the things and the resources and you know where you want to go and progress i mean hey your characters probably want some alcohol Figure out how to make a still. You know, the parts and pieces are around you. It allows you to be creative on the fly. Just like, how oh, we could use uh, this or that. And all of a sudden you're imagining things that are in your backyard and saying, there's so much that we always 
could have done with this stuff that makes it really fun. You give yourself some agency when you realize you really could be quite that capable and you have a direction for your characters to go. I guess it kind of reminds me a bit of, um, was it Dr. Stone? The anime I was where about to bring oh, that up. You're, yeah, you're describing Doctor Stone right now. Yes, you got you have your tech tree uh, of, of things that you want to start advancing. You let your players become the people that are. Oh, I'm smart. I know how to do this. That's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I think uh, kind of in that vein, but a little bit flip side. You know, thing about pitfalls is don't worry about knowing everything. Like when when you're running the game, knowing mm-hmm. actually how. Uh, yeah, you know something works that you've got to break it all down. You can generalize stuff uh, when you're describing it, so don't. Sometimes you know you can try and research stuff, but at some point in time, is that actually adding to the story you're doing with your players, or is it taking away your time and your focus? Right. So don't don't get stuck in everything has to be perfect. Everything has to be right because it's modern time. So I have to make sure that when I describe this firearm, I've got to, you know, you don't have to know everything about it, right? You, you can generalize some stuff. So you don't have to worry about, about that. And then if your players know more stuff about something and they're excited about mm-hmm. it and they go into mm-hmm. the details, that's great. You let them do that, but don't they're gonna worry know about, I don't, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. You, you know, because there, there's people who, who know a lot about stuff. It's like if you're doing a, a ship campaign and you actually have somebody who knows all the nautical terms where you're using left, right, and you're calling calling it a boat instead of a ship and stuff like that. And <laughs> yeah. you might drive other people crazy, right? But uh-huh. if you have somebody who knows those terms, then they'll throw those in and you'll get, get that uh, extra bit for it. But it's not destroyed just because you don't know everything about it, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. It's important to remember as the GM that you are not you are not the world. You are simply officiating the world. Because like <laughs> yeah. you, like you said you can get you can get caught up in those minute details. Mm. But really you're just kind of officiating what's going on and everybody's communicating together. It to to harken back to our past Except Mind Palace chat. We're all sharing this this waking dream that we all share in these games. And it's being affected by each of us in this dreamscape that we share in this daydream, this waking dream we play. Mm-hmm. I'm laughing just because at a hyperbolic end, it's like in a perfect world, the GM's like a lifeguard. Don't do much but whistle at people when they're being naughty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then everything else is like, just play and have fun in this world, right? <laughs> it's not far off. This pool, you mean? Yeah. Yes, this pool. <laughs> Swim. If you want to go to the deep end, be sure you can paddle. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, this is where we get a lot of these, uh, the ones that we have most today. The... Yeah. Ones that are, yeah, we can get kind of caught up in the ones that we do today. This is also where you would do probably your, the modern Megiddo would also be for something like um, those sci-fi tech level apocalypses. Because Scrat brought this up in, uh, he was like, what would Terminator fall under type of thing? I would Mm. advocate that Terminator, the first movie, would fall under a a pre-apocalypse is when it's when the story is taking place but the care the two two of the characters are from a post-apocalypse well mm-hmm. slightly intra-apocalypse but it's pretty much post-apocalypse so they're having to fight against the machines so mm-hmm. but the other ones I don't know maybe you could argue Judgment Day was still pre-apocalypse by the time, I don't know, by that time, you're probably, Skynet's already invented. We saw, if you believe the movie continuities past that point, that it didn't make any difference. So, forget that, <sighs> man. Forget that. <laughs> that's the way to, that's something not to do. 
don't do that to your players. Tell them that their their actions didn't matter anyway. So, because they didn't. The, the, that apocalypse still happened. It still always happened. The machines always rose up. <laughs> that was just an excuse for more movies. You start a new campaign. You don't have to yeah. come back. <laughs> yeah. Unlike Hollywood, you don't have to recycle old IPs. You can just make new ones. <laughs> Although, right. I mean, like, if you want to reskin some stuff, you had something for another IP, like, <laughs> don't do, uh, save yourself on work. If you didn't get to use it, find a way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, see, if you don't use something that you prepared for your post-apocalyptic game, you can recycle it because they won't know that you didn't use it, right? Your yeah, players didn't know that you didn't use that thing you had prepared for five sessions. You can put it into some mess. Unless you can't help but tell them I do. That's a problem I have. <laughs> Loose lips sink campaigns. <laughs> Were you trying to say something there, Scott? No, I was just laughing at the comment he made. Mm. Okay, one of the things I love about the the modern apocalyptic thing is you get a chance to romanticize real everyday life. And the, you know, everyone, you know, understands that there is a strange and probably at this point false perception of the good old days of yore. Mm. Um, whether you romanticize, you know, the, the roaring 20s or some medieval times, or maybe you're just like, man, the Egyptians, when they built the pyramids, really had it going. Like, if you're going to look back at those kind of times and with wonder, you get to bring some of that to your today setting, where you say, imagine if this was all gone, what would you want to bring back? And you have a great opportunity for your players to then fight to get that back. So let's take this from the kind of the post-apocalyptic side of things. You know, what is it that you're willing to go across town and either fight some monsters or risk infection or, um, you know, stave off some alien forces in order to get to bring back to your regular ordinary life. And in a sense, you get to celebrate a little bit about that. Celebrate clean water. Celebrate the ability to protect and defend yourself. Um, those, you know, celebrate, you know, we've got a big building up and running again, you know, inside here with the, the fluorescent lights and the sounds of people talking. It feels like Life is back to normal. I like that it aggrandizes that, but you know, we don't usually today have to fight to have our status quo. So it doesn't mean as much, though. I work pretty hard for my status quo. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure everyone does, but it would be more fun if I had to actually go out with guns ablazing, or if I had to invent some new tech, or build something from the ground up, or such to get there. I think one of the recent shows that has done this really well, and I'm very surprised that it hasn't come up yet, The Last of Us. Mm. Um, the Last of Us on HBO was fantastic at uh, specifically giving you that kind of feeling of we are wandering a wasteland now, fighting for our survival at all times, and occasionally we'll stumble upon a town that miraculously has electricity, Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's just a uh, it's a really cool ex exploration of um, trying to restart societies with the old comforts. Mm -hmm. I think to to build off of that something that to build off of that and what Zach was saying about getting back to normal and having that be a motivator. Uh, I think it's Zombieland. They had, uh, the guy just wanted to actually Twinkies. find a Twinkies. good Twinkie. He, <laughs> yes. th that's all he really was looking for. All this, you know, society had collapsed. There wasn't, people weren't close enough and organized enough to be able to bring it back together, really. Everybody was in the middle of, was intra apocalypse and starting to get to the post part of it. And it's like, I just want, just trying to find some Twinkies. 
He's literally going all over the country looking for some Twinkies because that's what got him up in the morning. And it can be that simple for some people. Those simple satisfactions can be enough. So you talked about uh, the the sense of accomplishment for getting back those normal things like being able to brew something. Your your characters would want to do that. Well, okay. Your characters are going to end up celebrating finding clean water and then using those copper tubings with certain tubs and containers under pressure to get that. And then they've got to grow their corn for their moonshine and got to be able to find some kind of sweetener, some kind of sugar to put in there. So all of that stuff. But once they do, you know. Yeah, that was like in Walking Dead when they actually had a hot shower because it used propane instead of electricity. (laughs) So just that that luxury of an actual hot shower. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that it's a it, it, well, it's certainly not a pitfall, but I'm thinking about in comparison to what we'll talk about next time. I think what we're ta- what everyone's mentioning is with the removal of magic and supernatural powers, a lot of it is in humanity, and that's the stories you're exploring there because you guys are talking about what the individuals can do with what's around them. And I was thinking too about going sci-fi of like. <clears throat> in a sci-fi post-apocalyptic setting, or it could be intra that you're in some kind of flotilla or some kind of spacecraft that you're having to keep going. It could even be a very personal story that maybe the rest of the world's okay, but you're stranded in space somewhere. I mean, and it maybe you're, the end of your personal apocalypse. Maybe you're a group of characters that are stranded on a different planet that has dinosaurs and there's other pods coming down and you're having to find them. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, that that's on a certain channel that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound familiar to me. No, no. But it becomes right. It becomes. I, I'm trying to think and see what you guys think about this of removing those supernatural aspects. It's very much the 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 apocalypse is either going to be naturally based or human based, right? Because even the technology is in uh-huh. some way originally human based. So both the downfall and the hope, both the the failure and the hope are set in the humanity and or whatever, you know, sentient race you're playing. Right. It'd be centered in a sentient race because you can do alien. So, right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it lends, what maybe expectations are there or what does it lend itself to better? Because we're doing that, we're removing all the supernatural aspects and it's very real physical. What you're, you can, deal with Mm -hmm. if somebody built a doomsday device someone in your and that that makes them feel powerful and foreboding you know someone in your team or your team together can build the the stop key to that device Mm -hmm. if someone Mm -hmm. engineered a plague then your team can engineer a cure and that gives some agency because the power that the campaign gives to the threat also is giving power to the players as they overcome it. Not just on a, we survive day to day, but rather this thing destroyed the world. What we did today was the thing that was the key that fixed it or that will has the, have the chance in case they all, you know, TPK, but you know, you got the antidote to the, to the right people and you know, you Never waste the death, right? Why waste the death? <laughs> Never waste the death. <laughs> I'm now that I'm thinking about it, I'm actually having difficulty thinking of a sci-fi post-apocalypse example in media. Um, there's oh, you mean like two... like Battlefield Earth? <laughs> <laughs> like Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Like Battlestar Galactica where where you have this okay. c- cyclical, you know, people bring about their own dif- downfall by by building Cylons. There's battle know, in there the, somewhere. The, the world has the world has been destroyed. There's only a few survivors to it. It's all sci-fi. Like how do you find resources? How do you not tip your hand to the enemy that you have inadvertently created? And ultimately, how do you keep this from happening again? 
by reconciling differences that you otherwise never would have thought were there. It all comes down to the technological and the social and just the bare bones survival of the people. <laughs> yeah, I was actually thinking about about that because they were having to jump, but sometimes when they jumped, some of the ships couldn't jump with them. And so they were <sighs> wiped out. Yeah. So it was like a slow attrition. Mm. And also the fear that some of your players might actually be wanting the apocalypse to happen. Yeah. So Maybe they're happy be... with, with the apocalypse. Nothing says it has to be sad. Or they just want to yeah, see what or... happens. She would never do that. Yeah. <laughs> Some or, people you know, just where want you plant to... that one of your characters is a scion, right? And scion. Or, or, uh, whatever the term is for, right? Mm-hmm. But <laughs> then you plant that bridge. Oh, one of them, you might be that. It's like, which player, which player is conniving against us with the GM. I don't know. How would you find out if, if one of the if one of your players was actually a artificial man-made thing that was maybe hundreds of years old and extraordinarily pro, pro, you know prodigious at, at killing things? <laughs> Paul. <laughs> um, <laughs> how could you tell that they were a synth? I don't know. <laughs> but they the would keep up bringing tell. Battlefield Earth. Yeah, that would, yeah. Solid distraction. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then the, that does bring up the idea of traitors within the midst, which is something that you do see mm. in a lot of apocalyptic media. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I guess in in a certain way you can term the Matrix as mm-hmm. post-apocalyptic. I was just thinking that. Right. And that yeah. traitor within the midst there. It goes kind of off the rails with the second and third one. But uh, yeah. 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 the first but one... Is, is- Definitely. Great, great character's background for a, a traitor to of ignorance is bliss. I just love that. Mm-hmm. Summing up that character that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what else is technically an apocalypse story? Uh, the movie adaptation of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Oh, that's yes. a. I, I'd play that. <laughs> well done. <laughs> that is apocalypse. <laughs> And it's actually Apocalypse. one that we haven't really... A taco lips. Oh! Taco lips. No! <laughs> cool. uh, but I think, I think that would, that, like, I, it's, it's a good story. I can't say it's one of my absolute favorites, but it's definitely one that I enjoy re-watching from time to time. Um, and I, I it's, it, it's fun to explore um, what if it is one of the characters that created this apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, if, what if it's actually our fault? Yep. Well, there was that. That falls into that either man-made or some other kind of apocalypse there. That right. technological apocalypse, technically, I suppose. You did a job for the people. I guess it would be without bordering on natural disaster. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, that is classic though too. Well, on the flip side of that, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where there's something coming in, I know it's like you're canceled oh, now. Oh yeah, duh. <laughs> Can't believe I forgot that one. <laughs> you're canceled. Well, it's hard to it's hard to call that one a full on apocalypse because he they no, literally remake the Earth. It's apocalypse, right? Yeah, it's, 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 everything's back the way it was. Yeah. So, well, I mean, except for the people, Z systems are hard to get rid of. They just keep popping back into the timeline. Like, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't build a decent bypass. <laughs> <laughs> oh bad. Uh, Huey Lucron from the the original Transformers. Oh, yeah. that's that's yeah. a mobile apocalypse. <laughs> that goes back. That goes back to the uh, that slow roll of an apocalypse to know that Unicron is coming. It's like I'm knowing the Death Star is coming. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the Silver Surfer mm-hmm. Galactica yep. is coming. He's gonna mm. eat you all. How glorious! How glorious! Just here to let you know, FYI, you're all dead in a few days. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> but I, I don't know. You you can do those those apocalypses that slow roll in a modern one you can definitely do that if you want to you can do it on the serious side if you want to watch the slow degradation of a society 
and participate in the story around there. Or you can do it, like going back to the Cloudy with a Chance of Meatball thing, you can do it where in a fun way, in a wacky way, figuring oh. that out. Mm. Okay, so then we have to talk about what is probably the most fun and unique apocalyptic oh, story ever. Um, Marvel's What If did an apocalypse I have never seen before. It's the party apocalypse. It's where Thor and his Isgardian buddies come down and just start a party across the world that ends up destroying things as everyone just turns into a giant rave and just like, yeah, this is what the world is. Just so many aliens here. We're all having a great time. And it's terrifying. I don't know if I've ever seen anything narratively like it. We we just wind up having fun destroying our own world because that's what everyone else is doing and there's nothing for it. It takes a deus ex machina intervention in a modern story. Actually, Actually, it's his mom. It's literally Deus Ex Machina. Yes, right? I was about to but say it's literally Deus. It is. So, <laughs> but it's <laughs> it's it's apocalypse by party. It can be fun, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's entertaining. I like until you bring up what if because <laughs> that has a lot of really really good examples of apocalypses. Ooh, yeah. Like pretty much every episode of What If is a it's a different kind of apocalypse. Doctor I, Strange. I think they're all interim. Hmm. Because you you've got your zombies. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got your party apocalypse. You've got your um, Doctor Strange messed up. So a normal day. I'll so that's that. I'm a, like that's not a crazy what if. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take much. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, but what if you messed up harder? <laughs> it's that office meme she's Good. she's telling him stop doing stuff dr strange you keep messing up he says i'm gonna mess up harder, I'm mess up harder. <laughs> just to spite you <laughs> that's funny all right so let's get to f- we're we're trying to get it good here so let's get to final thoughts um let me see we're going to do final thoughts with Avenue, Levi, and then Okayist, and Scrat, and then me. Man. I I, th- I think pretty much we hit on it there with, for me, it's the, the idea with when we're looking at no supernatural stuff, no magic stuff, no fantasy, which I as a fantasy nerd, tend towards looking at that. It's very much a human story that you're looking at, and that that's going to really influence. That might m- help you decide, do you want to do this, based on what we've talked about in the previous chats, of uh, looking at how to help you decide what type of apocalypse, when you're doing it. Part of that is going to determine there's some story themes that are lend themselves obviously you can pretty much tell a story in anything but it might lend itself better and looking at player expectations of course too will help you decide whether you need supernatural forces in here or if you really want to make it dirty grounded reality based either fighting against something natural or man-made um look at what you want to tell look at the story you want to tell and see where it fits best i think will help you and then of course Everything else everyone said is awesome. Oh. Yeah. Chance? Yeah, I mean, I just think, uh, you know, don't be afraid to steal. <laughs> uh, get inspired by, you know, media, by, you know, things like that. Um, and just twist it to make it your own. Can you give us an example of what sort of a piece of media that might inspire us? Well, a great be. piece of media to inspire is Battlefield Earth. You can just take that and just really run with it in a modern setting. It's just so great. I mean, taking um, retired F-15s that uh, will just magically start working and go attack the aliens, even though they had it beforehand, but you can use it after fact to still destroy them. You know. That's a built-in mechanic in the game. Yeah, it's yeah. a built-in mechanic in the game. So, you know, <laughs> you use the failed technology from before and it'll work now. This is a great... <laughs> it works. I love it. So, <laughs> but, That's you know, real, though. yeah, just, just be inspired by media. Um, twist it to make it your own. And, uh, yeah, just, don't, don't 
try to be too exact and perfect. And the media, too, will probably guide you on expectations players might have coming in. Oh, yeah. Because if you've seen what, mm-hmm. what, you know, Hollywood and story writers are doing, you either know what you want to lean into or subvert. Yeah, that's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna lean into the 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 reflective angle of playing a modern um, a modern apocalyptic story, where don't don't be afraid to explore with your players just how it makes you think about real life. Um, mm-hmm. You think think about the responsibility we have. Like we are currently in a pre-apocalyptic story. All of us are. Mm-hmm. We have a chance to influence our world, our society, our people, our health, our engineering for good or for evil. And that's a responsibility we all have playing through these science fiction and modern kind of apocalyptic stories should let us think carefully about what our responsibility is towards what we are growing, what we are creating, whether it's AIs as weapons of war or AIs to replace wonderful people like Bob Ross. <laughs> and also So the worst apocalypse. Of, the worst apocalypse. I know. Wait, Adam. <laughs> um hmm. but also also um think about how it just gives us value and just everyday appreciation. Just, you know, it's great that we got to we got to run out for the snacks today. And just buy this with some money instead of having to pull up a sawed-off shotgun and, and to threaten some guy for his hoard of Twinkies. Mm. Um, you know, those mm. are things that you don't always realize you appreciate. And then lastly, and again, just kind of touching on the sensitivity issues. Like, if your group can use it as, um, you know, in a sense of, in a sense of therapy to just to work through issues. Again, if they're comfortable with that and they want to explore things like, you know some contagion like scenario to play through scenarios and to talk about the hardships through that. It can help people. If you're willing to talk about it, engage with it, dissociate that little bit. I can just say personally for me, it has been, and I'm enjoying my current post-apocalyptic post disease, post plague storytelling because it has let me reflect on what I lost and what it means to my character and a little bit of that then comes back to what does it mean to me but 100 percent, ask your group and check and see is that something that they're comfortable with so that you're not causing undue upset all right what you got levi so from just like a game system perspective. In many ways, we've been talking about a more down-to-earth style story where little wins really matter. And I think you might, depending on the system you go for, watch out for how high of a level you let people get to, and maybe aim for a more grounded system. Because in many ways, these are not only, but like, pretty meaningfully survival-style games to work through these. And Mm. I feel like if you're not paying attention to the system you put this in, you might get to situations that really break the feel you're going for. Mm. Yeah, that can happen. Mm -hmm. So just... Watch out that your system fits your vibe would be the pithy way to phrase that. Nice. I thought when he said you gotta think about the system you're gonna play that and then he was gonna suggest powered by the apocalypse for an apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought no, it was a good. joke. <laughs> 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 Two on the nose. Uh though I mean like there are some. Like if you're you're talking the uh blades in the dark mm-hmm. which is that's <laughs> They they have slight distinctions over more specific details within those that I don't know because I don't play many of those. But like that's a kind of grungy enough thing that that could easily be post apocalyptic. Yeah. Or to throw out the Cthulhu system, where it's like yeah. it's not about being heroic. <laughs> You're lucky if you make any rolls in yeah. the night. It well, sets that feeling if you want it to be down and grungy and survival. Yeah, even Pulp Cthulhu is still ed- got an edge on it. So, 
where I'll show Cthulhu dreamt made by people I know. Yes. <laughs> I've had fun playtesting it. I I put it a little closer to Pulp Thulu for a decent mm. amount of it, but just what was because that like you called? Hmm? What was the name of that? Cthulhu Dreamt. Uh I put it in huh. the Discord. I personally know slash was roommates one of the core designers on it. Okay. Oh, cool. Uh and it's the Is that they had another system going? they built called Sojourn. Uh, that was all about expending resources over, like, a longer time. Yeah. So, Cthulhu Dreamt is built off of that. So, for individual roles, you have a chance of doing some insane things. But in doing so, you injure yourself and lose the ability to do more things throughout the rest of the day. I'll, have to, I'll find it for you, Zach. I'll get the link to you. That's cool. Thank okay. you. Yeah, cool. the art works really cool on that, too. Yeah, and yeah. they're uh, making music I, I, for it. I have not heard, heard like, I, from what I saw, they were pushing the music um, almost on top of everything, everything else. Um, yes. But I haven't heard any of it, and I, I really, really want to. Just looking at this. Uh, you- on the Discord. Amazing. Thank you. Slash, uh, I will. Oh, not on this. Let me. I will. Uh, I meant to say the Kickstarter. Uh, I'll look it up. And anyway, my thoughts are done. Uh, we can move on to someone else. Sorry. Okay, okay. For the side okay, rail. Great. What you got, Dennis? Um. Well, if you're not sure which system uh, you would like to run your Apocalypse game in, uh, you could always try a setting and genre agnostic system. Um, oh. I, I heard... Uh, <laughs> Seriously, though, we, we've run Apocalypse, and it's amazing. Um, I will, for my final thoughts for this uh, segment, I will echo uh, what's already been said, as I feel like I'm just a broken record at this point, but um, now I forgot what's going to be said. Spotlight just wipes the memory immediately, <laughs> every time. <laughs> Talking with your players, um, I assume. Yeah, sure. We'll just we'll just fall back on that. Talk to your players. <laughs> um, but I think uh, as far oh, I remember. Um, we'll see if this is uh, where we go in the next segment for when we start talking about magic and fantasy apocalypses. Um, but I think there is going to be a very stark distinction between these two of in this one where there is no magic we are going to lean harder into the uh, making the world relatable um, making it um, more personable where the players can understand better the feelings that their characters are having whereas in a fantasy apocalypse we're doing the opposite where we're trying to get away from this shitty world that we live in and tell a different story that has nothing to do with it. Mm. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the biggest distinction, uh, uh, or the, one of the biggest attributes of, uh, the sort of modern apocalypse story. Okie dokie. All right, Scrat, what you got? I'm so on it. <laughs> so, really, all I got, um, I was re- re- trying to remember there was a show. So, there was this, this girl I used to be with, and she watched a lot of terrible TV. And this was like right at the <laughs> note I said used to be with. <laughs> um, this was, I, f- I feel like this was the prime of Twilight, right? It was just everybody wanted to be Twilight. So, of course, the show focused on young adult main characters, you know, teenagers saving the day. But it was, I only caught bits and pieces of it, but the power grid went out, like, across the entire, co- I don't know if it was the whole world or just the whole country, but all the power went out. And everything just descended from there. Like, you know, the first couple of weeks, okay, people are just getting hungry. 
Then they started getting angry. Then they started getting a little violent. It just got worse and worse and worse. All that happened was the power went out. And then just eventually, just chaos. Like, there was all these ragtag run-and-gun factions and stuff like that. And The only redeeming thing it had, um, I don't know the actor's name. He's the bad guy in the new Far Cry game. He's the We Are Not the Same meme. Um, mm-hmm. What is that guy's name? Keep going, I'll find it. Yeah, well, He's you in know Breaking what I'm Bad too. And- yeah, that guy. Um, he was in it, and of course he was. He did a phenomenal job, but um, everybody else was terrible. Oh, but I, I thought it was. I thought it was a pretty neat concept. It was like, oh yeah, just just take electricity away, and that that was enough to break society. And I can believe it because we actually had not too long ago the power went out around here for a week and. Uh, People were getting pretty testy. So, <laughs> uh, you're talking about Giancarlo Esposito. Yes, Esposito. Yep, that's him. One of the best bad guy voices. Uh, uh, oh, he gosh. does so, so good. good. And see, his character was. Uh, I probably should have brought this up. Um, he was like this insurance salesman, and he got walked over by his boss and his wife, both. So he was like just miserable. And then when the world started going to crap, he stepped up and became like big bad boss because he nothing was really holding him back at that point. So he got to mm. break free. It's just like man, gravitas. That guy's got gravitas. He yeah, does. yeah. Mm. Good at what he does. So. Mm-hmm. Okie doke. Well, I better get to mine. I can see my my fellows fading. So I'm I'm try I'll be quick. Uh, mine will kind of blend into our next chat because when you're looking at settings and you're looking at things that are kind of apocalyptic and stuff like that, Warhammer is a perpetual apocalypse. <laughs> so <laughs> you can you keep kind of buying more minis. There is the apocalypse. <laughs> it's the mini apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> and painting them. That's really good, though. That had to be real. painted, right, Zach? You can't leave yes, minis yeah. unpainted. If you, don't, yeah. if you don't paint them, you don't care about them. Zach lives in a perpetual apocalypse. <laughs> he never played. <laughs> uh, Sorry, that's an inside joke. So. <laughs> Warhammer uh, is actually pretty good to look for, because we're talking about sci-fi. Now, there is magic in Warhammer, which why this kind of bleeds into the next chat. But even if there wasn't, with the way that the aliens work and the way that they're still doing space travel and stuff like that, and the, just how it's mm-hmm. how it all goes around and plays, it's still apocalyptic. It's it's a dystopian apocalypse. It's a it's a degraded yeah. apocalypse. And in it, there's actually a key point that would be good to keep in mind for you and your games if you want to be a bit more realistic with your apocalypse. The tech priests don't actually know how it works. They just know what's supposed to be in there and that it works if those components are in there. Mm. So Mm -hmm. they can't make new technology. They can only take technology that they have and imitate it and work from that. Which is very interesting... When you go and you apply mm-hmm. it to a real life, a lot of people are that way. We all have I was cell phones. Say, we never do yeah. that in real life. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all have cell phones, but not one of us here could make a cell phone that would function mm-hmm. on the the grid of the cell phone networks because you have to have proprietary access to those things. And there's a whole bunch of things that you can mess with with people with trying to figure that out and everything. So, anyway. Are you saying we can't prove this isn't magic? <laughs> sure. So, let's talk about it in our next show. Oh, okay. All right. Segue. Well, we thank you, travelers and viewers, for being with us. And we hope that next time you will join us for the Apocalypse Fantastica. That's not proper grammar for whatever fake imitation language I'm doing 
It's just what I'm calling it. So, we'll see you there. As always, have a great day. God bless and enjoy. Bye. 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 Goodbye. This content was made possible by travelers and viewers like you. Thank you. I had to laugh because only a nerd would say, in my fake language, this is not proper grammar. (laughs) 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 And I'm totally down for it and agree. (laughs) Just... I love it. Yeah. Fun I'm, fact, uh, Tolkien, in the end, was really just writing uh, Lord of the Rings and other Middle-Earth books to support his linguistics hobby. Yes. <laughs> yep. Because he couldn't he really get enough teaching it at a guys. Like, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to bow out here. I'm starting to get a migraine. Oh, that's okay. getting, that's so. all right. The narrative will be that we... Um, we strangled you for for threatening to bring up Battlefield. I started, again. I started playing the movie for you. Yes, and so we're gonna say he's right off frame. He just he couldn't not watch he's it. Just watching the movie. <laughs> uh, awesome. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah.